I heard that countdown. I did. Hey, this is James Spann. Welcome back. I thought I'd do the weather school today here at the uh, beach. We're talking about hurricanes. Why not? By the way, that great video with the countdown is from Mike Olbinski. His photography work is simply amazing. Go follow him on YouTube or Vimeo to see his work and support him. He's just a great guy and an amazing photographer. Mike Olbinski, O-L-B-I-N-S-K-I. So, welcome back. For those that are new, we are doing this every Thursday morning, 10 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Eastern. I'll be doing it for at least the next month on through early to mid-May. Since school is homeschool now, why not do a little science? Uh, typically, I would be in a school this time of the year doing weather programs for children, but I can't. So let's just do it this way. This is good. This works, okay? Uh, so what have you guys been doing lately? Uh, you know, last night I actually went to the TV station. Now, I've been doing my weather segments here at the house. This is my home studio, and I think most of you know how this works, right? You see that nasty green color behind me? That is called chroma key green. And when the camera sees green, it magically turns into weather maps. And that's how we do it at the station. And that's how I'm doing it at home. My wife is a very kind, loving person. And yes, she let me paint my back wall green so I can do the weather at home. It's been that way for a long time. This is nothing new, but this is what the home studio looks like. But we had some uh, fairly bad weather last night. And what we're doing, if we do have severe weather or big storms, I go back into the TV station. So I worked at the station yesterday and last night. And our two cats were glad to see me. We have two cats that live at my TV station at ABC 3340. Uh, they've been with us, I think, for over 10 years, a long time. They're part of our family, little black female, an old gray tomcat, and they were awfully glad to see me. But let's do what we always do to start this off. We like to look at a current weather satellite photograph. This is a nice composite showing the entire half of the planet. This was captured about an hour ago, and that's what we look right now. Wait, right now. Hey, we're all down there. Can you see us? Well, no, because the satellites are 22,500 miles over the Earth's equator. But hey, this is April. We always have some busy weather this time of the year, especially in the southern United States where I'm located. This is what it looked like last night in Cache, Arkansas. We've had tornadoes. We've had large hail. It's been a pretty rough ride here for parts of the southern states over the past 24 hours. I've heard of no injuries, thankfully, from these tornadoes. But remember, this is the month of April. We talked about tornadoes here, uh, what, a week or two ago. And for parts of the southern United States, this is the main time of the year for tornadoes. This was when we expect things like that. And also, we had this going on in a lot of places last night. Does anybody know what this is? Now, this was falling from a thunderstorm, little balls of ice we know as... Hail. Yes, that was hail falling last night. That actually, I want to say, was taken up north in uh, parts of Wisconsin, but many, many states had some uh, large hail last night. So let's get right to it. Uh, let's go to a couple of kid questions. And by the way, if you would like to submit a question for this online weather school, at the end, I will give you some contact information and you, you can do that. So let's hear a couple of questions. Let's go. Mr. James Spann, how do hurricanes happen? And my family was in Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. Hi, my name is Reagan, and I'm in second grade, and I'm eight years old. I go to Pebble High School, and my question is, why do hurricanes come from Africa? Oh, these are good questions. The questions are about hurricanes, and that's the subject today. We're going to talk about hurricanes and tropical storms and let's say this now we don't have any I don't have any to show you in the northern hemisphere right now because this is not the time of the year when they happen the water is a little too cold but let's start with the basics how in the world does a hurricane form we'll watch this hurricanes are very large and intense storms but where do these giant storms come from a hurricane starts with the warm water found near the equator. Hurricanes typically only form in tropical regions where the ocean is at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit. These warm waters evaporate, creating warm, moist air which acts as fuel for the storm. Wind is also needed for a hurricane to form. Many hurricanes in the United States are caused by winds blowing across the Atlantic Ocean from Africa. 
This wind causes even more of the warm water to evaporate into the air. The warm, moist air then rises high into the atmosphere, where it begins to cool. Way up there, the water vapor condenses back into liquid water droplets. Water droplets in the atmosphere form clouds, including big, stormy, cumulonimbus clouds. As the warm air continues rising upward, the winds begin blowing in a circular pattern around a center. The spiraling winds gather up a cluster of big thunderstorm clouds. Once the spinning winds reach 74 miles per hour, the storm has officially become a hurricane. Hurricanes are huge. They can be 10 miles high and over 1,000 miles across. Once a hurricane hits land, it runs out of warm, moist air and its winds begin to weaken. But the storm can still cause lots of damage to communities near the coast. Thankfully, we have weather satellites that are constantly monitoring the conditions down here on Earth. The Gozar series of weather satellites scan the hemisphere every 10 minutes and the U.S. every 5 minutes, keeping an eye on conditions that might cause a hurricane to form. Once a hurricane forms, the satellites can help predict the storm's intensity and track it minute by minute. This information allows meteorologists to deliver early warnings and help people stay safe. Find out more about Earth weather at NOAA SciJinx. So one thing about hurricanes you've learned, you've got to have warm ocean water. And that's where they form. They form over the ocean. Hurricanes don't form over land. Uh, they don't happen over lakes or rivers. You need a big ocean, a big ocean basin. And the water in the ocean needs to be awfully warm. So they don't happen in wintertime. They happen when? Yeah, in summer when the water is warm. Sometimes early fall. Generally speaking, you need to have water about 80 degrees Fahrenheit for a hurricane to form. And in the Atlantic Basin, that typically begins to happen around the 1st of June. So that's when hurricane season begins, the 1st of June through the end of November. Again, that's for the Atlantic Basin, that area close into the United States. And hurricanes don't start as hurricanes. They start as tropical depressions. Maybe you've heard us talk about that. These are relatively weak systems with a closed circulation. The winds are under 39 miles an hour. And if a tropical depression comes along, the biggest issue, it's from flooding. They can produce a lot of rain. People think, oh, it's just a little tropical depression. The winds are under 39 miles per hour. It's not bad at all. And generally speaking, you're right. It's not that bad. But again, they can pack a lot of moisture. And when they move in, and especially if they don't move quickly, they can bring 10, 15, 20 inches of rain causing big flooding problems. So even with those little weak depressions, we have to watch those. So if a depression keeps growing, what comes next? Yeah, a tropical storm. This is where the winds begin to get stronger. The winds are drawn in near the center, and the winds are between 39 and 73 miles per hour. And again, tropical storms like tropical depressions can bring a whole lot of rain. That's the biggest problem, but that wind can be enough to knock down some trees and knock down some power lines. But once those winds get a little stronger, then the system becomes a hurricane. Yeah, the winds can be very dangerous in a hurricane, greater than 74 miles per hour. And that's enough to really cause some damage. And if it keeps on getting stronger, a hurricane becomes what we call a major hurricane. Thankfully, these don't happen a lot, but they can. Uh, this is where the damage can be awfully bad. The winds are greater than 115 miles per hour. And if you notice, we've got these wind scale numbers. This is what the hurricane scale looks like. Now, we've talked about the tornado scale that's a different kind of scale. That's called the Enhanced Fujita Scale. This is our hurricane scale. Hurricane categories called the Saffir-Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale, named after two famous hurricane forecasters. And our EF scale for tornadoes, it's 0 to 5. The hurricane scale is 1 to 5. A Category 1 hurricane, that's the and I don't want to say weak. That's not a good word because a Category 1 hurricane is not weak. It's got winds of 74 to 95 miles an hour. But again, that's going to produce some wind damage. And Category 2 hurricanes have winds of 96 to 110 miles per hour. 
Imagine being out in wind like that. But the major hurricanes are categories three, four, and five. And fives are very rare, like those EF5 tornadoes are rare. Thankfully, category five hurricanes are very rare. But when they happen, they have winds of 157 miles per hour. Isn't that amazing? And here's something else. That wind is bad, but most of the damage from hurricanes is not caused by wind. It's caused by water. Hurricanes push a wall of water called a storm surge into the coast. And that water can cause so much damage. And sometimes the storm surge can be 10, 15, 20 feet or higher. And that wall of water causes so much damage. So the next question is, where do hurricanes form and where do they go? Well, how about this for a mess? Look at all those colored lines. Looks like a bunch of scribble scrabble, doesn't it? Well, actually, this is a very interesting map to me. This is a track of every hurricane on record in the Atlantic Basin and also in the Eastern Pacific. All of those little bitty lines represent a hurricane. And you can see they tend to form in the Atlantic and they move to the west and then they curve to the north. They turn to the right and they keep turning and ultimately they're blown back out to sea if they survive back in the North Atlantic. And then we have hurricanes that form in the Pacific off the coast of Mexico. And those can try and get a little farther to the north, but they have a hard time doing that because the water typically is kind of cold. So this is the one that we worry about where I am. This is the Atlantic Basin. And if you live in cities like Miami or New Orleans or Panama City Beach or Charleston or Virginia Beach or even Long Island or Boston, this is where you have to worry about these hurricanes coming from the Atlantic Basin. And like we talked about, the hurricane season begins June 1st. Now, we can have them a little earlier than June 1st. We've had them before in May. But most of them happen June through November. And the really big ones tend to happen in August and September. Why? That's when the water tends to be warmest. Now, hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin north of the equator spin counterclockwise. And our friends at the National Hurricane Center monitor those, and they are called hurricanes. But do you know that in other parts of the world, hurricanes have a slightly different name? Uh-huh. Now, again, for the Atlantic Basin where we are and the Eastern Pacific, they're hurricanes. But what about the Western Pacific? They're not called hurricanes. They are called, it starts with a T, a typhoon. Yeah, it's the same storm, just with a different name. And below the equator in the Southern Hemisphere, they are called cyclones. How about that? But again, this is where we are in the Atlantic Basin. This is a look at the peak of the season. If you average out all the hurricanes we've had every year, they tend to peak on September 10th. That's the peak of the hurricane season. And you can have them in June, you can have them in November, but many of them, many of them happen in August and September. So the question is, how do we forecast these things? Understand, we have no weather instruments over the ocean, and boy, we are so thankful for weather satellites. I think you know that. The weather satellites give us some amazing shots of hurricanes. And boy, the weather satellites have gotten so good, you can almost see right down into them. But the question is, who forecasts these hurricanes? Where do they go? How strong do they get? When do they start to recur? Well, that's done at the National Hurricane Center, which is near Miami, way down in South Florida. I had a chance to visit. It's been a long time. The last time I was in the National Hurricane Center was back in the mid-80s. But they do a marvelous job. And this is a little more about the National Hurricane Center and the great work they do for all of us. We're guiding the big picture when there's a, a hurricane event that affects the United States. We issue a tropical weather outlook four times a day that talks about systems that could become tropical cyclones at any time during the next five days. And then when we have active storms, we're putting out a forecast and advisory package every six hours that includes a five-day track and intensity forecast, forecasting the size of the storm. And then we're also coordinating with our international partners and within the National Weather Service to issue the necessary watches and warnings, and also coordinating with partners like the Navy and the U.S. military and other interests. 
Our products are really designed to help emergency managers and the general public and the media convey the message about the storm's impacts on the large scale. We also have a big preparedness and outreach mission where we educate emergency managers, other meteorologists about the hazards that are associated with tropical storms and hurricanes and help them understand our products, forecast uncertainty so that they can make the best decisions they can during an event. So for example, calling for evacuations based on storm surge or knowing how to position resources and understanding their risk. Well, the products and services that come out of TAF-B, the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch specifically, are detailed marine weather forecasts for the next five days, including wind speed information, wind direction, significant wave height, wave direction, wave period, as well as any significant types of weather, such as showers, thunderstorms, dense smoke, any other kinds of obstruction to visibility, and associated hazards, such as gale warnings or tropical storm and hurricane warnings for the open waters. It can be stressful, but it can also be very exciting to be involved in big events and know that you're making a positive difference, not only for the office here, but for the agency and the country as a whole. So it's very fulfilling work, and it's something that I, I really do enjoy. So that's what they do at the National Hurricane Center, and they do a great job. Remember, 100, 200 years ago, thousands of years ago, hurricanes have always been here, but people had no idea they were coming. People that live on a coastline, they just don't know. And hurricanes a long time ago were just horrible because the lack of warning, a lot of problems. But at least today, we typically know they're coming. So we thank our friends at the National Hurricane Center for doing a great job. But let's talk about some big hurricanes over the past couple of years. And here's an interesting thing about hurricanes. They get a name. Everybody watching this, you've got a name. You have a name. You know your name. I have a name. Well, hurricanes have names because they can stay out there for days and they can stay out there for weeks. We don't name tornadoes. Why? Well, they don't last long enough. A lot of tornadoes last for 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and they're long gone. By the time we decide a tornado is Tornado Bob, Bob is gone. But hurricanes can be out there for a long time. This was one two years ago, and boy, this was a bad one. This was ultimately rated a cat category five on the scale I showed you. That's the biggest hurricane we have And the name of this hurricane was, and I bet you know this if you live in Florida, it was called Hurricane Michael. Boy, this was a really dangerous hurricane, and this was coming right up towards some fairly populated areas, places like Panama City Beach, Mexico Beach, Port St. Joe, Indian Pass. These are lovely places on the Florida Gulf Coast. Boy, look at the eye of Michael coming right into Mexico Beach. That's remarkable. Weather satellites have gotten so good. The resolution is so high. We can see things we simply couldn't see a long time ago. Now, this was a scary situation. Now, we actually have some meteorologists that go into the hurricane landfall spots to cover them for the world to see. During Hurricane Michael, a friend of mine, a meteorologist named Ginger Z was in Mexico Beach when this Category 5 hurricane came in. Many of you know Ginger. She is the chief meteorologist for ABC News. If you watch Good Morning America, you'll see Ginger every morning, and occasionally she's on World News Tonight uh, in the evenings as well. But Ginger was an intern with us here at ABC 3340 several years ago. She was a college student from Valparaiso University, and boy, we knew she was brilliant. She grasped the science, and what a great role model Ginger is for girls and young women that want to be scientists. Listen, you can do this. But it was scary for us on that day. I want to go back and show a special report from ABC News on Ginger Z and her experience in the middle of the landfall of a Category 5 hurricane by the name of Michael. Hurricane made landfall, took direct aim at Mexico Beach where Ginger was, and you know, we had an anxious moment during our special report when we actually lost contact with Ginger at the height of the storm. Thank goodness she had hunkered down out of harm's way, but she also saw something never seen in all her years covering monster storms, a home washed away right in front of her eyes. We start the day reporting on a balcony across from a blue house. If I don't feel comfortable, I'm going to stand right inside the door here. You could feel Michael on the way. The pressure suddenly plummeting. My ears have been popping for a half hour. I'm not standing outside because I can't. And I won't because it is just too dangerous. We have seen debris flying, pieces of homes, um, certainly huge. You can hear it. I mean, just take a listen to that. That incredible roar. 
I am constantly trying to keep the cool. We are in a cement building. We are in the safest place we can possibly be at this point. We're not going to be the only ones dealing with hurricane force winds. We ride out Michael's direct hit on the second floor of a cement condo in Mexico Beach. And there goes more. I don't know if you're hearing the crashing. Yeah. Large chunks of debris seen flying by. I think at this point we're going to start to wrap up. We retreat Not further inside. Door, but look, we've had to step away from the door because debris is flying so close to our hotel. That, you see that right there. It looks so much like the, the, the hurricane I always describe to people, and that is a washing machine. You have all of this water, you have all of this wind, and you can't see anything. Just 20 minutes ago, I was able to see the homes right across. I have no idea if they are there still. I just saw something I have never seen in real life. I saw an entire home taken off of its foundation and rolled down the street. That is the type of storm surge we're talking about right here in Mexico City at this moment. You can't see it, but we could just start to make out, and I saw the roof on its side um, rolling down the street. My heart is racing. I, again, I have never seen something like a, an entire home, a well-built home, rolling down the street. We just watched that happen in real time. And I'll tell you right now, it makes you shake. We see firsthand that storm surge can be the most dangerous part of the storm. That is where the house used to be. Finally, we're ready to head outside again. So we rode out Hurricane Michael in an interior space that was safe, but now is the first time that it's safe to come out here. And I have to tell you, the home that I saw floating away That blue house that was across from us is no longer there, simply gone. And then we head over to the other side of the condo. We saw that house taken off its foundation, but there were also several houses right there. Yeah, there were three, um, a triplex there and a house, and then one house in the back. Um, there was a lady in a house there who was parked, and she didn't go, and now everything's gone. I mean, there's nothing left nothing. there, so we can't imagine where she is. Within that house is your wedding dress. Everything that I have for my wedding is in my house. Which is in two weeks. Two weeks. It's supposed to be two weeks from now, and you can't even imagine, even if the house is standing, I'm the it's damage. It's probably flooded and gone. For Good Morning America, Ginger Z, ABC News. That was scary stuff. Uh, let me tell you what. I have covered some hurricanes in my time. I've been doing this a long time. My first hurricane was in 1979 to cover for television called Hurricane Frederick in Mobile, Alabama. But that was a Category 3. It wasn't a 5 like Ginger's Storm Michael. The first time I ever experienced one at landfall was one called Eloise back when I was in college in the mid-'70s. We were there volunteering with ham radio equipment, and I covered a storm called Hurricane Andrew that was a bad one back in 1992. I covered the Louisiana landfall. But uh, we're glad Ginger made it through that, but what a story she has to tell. Uh, we had a bad one last year. This was called Hurricane Dorian. And if you watch that disturbance in the lower right-hand part of the screen, that is a system that is becoming a depression, a storm, in a hurricane, you can see how now it's starting to look like a hurricane with that good ventilation. You can see the spiral bands wrapping into that. And the problem with Dorian, boy, this was a bad storm. Dorian just decided to sit and sit and sit in the same place right over an island nation called the Bahamas, which is just to the east of the state of Florida. And uh, you now can see the eye right in the middle of the hurricane opening up. And when you see that eye, you know it's very well organized. And what happened, the steering currents just went away. There was nothing to move the hurricane. And accordingly, it just sat there. In fact, here's a little closer look at Dorian sitting right on top of the Bahamas for hours and hours and hours, battering those islands with incredible amounts of wind, the storm surge, the rain, freshwater flooding. This was not a good situation. Here's a close-up look at the eye of Dorian. Again, this is remarkable. And the nice thing about these weather satellites, you boys and girls can see these. There's a lot of great pages that NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they have with satellite images just like this. You can watch these in real time. It's really fascinating. If you like weather, it's amazing what you can see online. So weather satellites are crucial, but we still need data. You know, we talked about the weather balloons a few weeks ago. Every day, twice a day, we launch weather balloons with weather instruments that send back weather data to us. Well, we take those same packages, put them in a little different form, and they get to ride on an airplane. And boy, these people are great. The hurricane hunters. 
This is the United States Air Force, and this is at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, and those are C-130 airplanes, and they will literally fly right in to hurricanes. Like This is a flight going into Hurricane Irma a few years ago, and uh, what they do, and understand these are specialists, and you, you, let me say one thing about the hurricane hunters. They don't go above the storm or around the storm. They fly right through the storm, typically at about 10,000 feet. Do you think it's bumpy in there? Yeah, it's bumpy. I mean, all the seats are padded with all kind of extra cushioning because it gets pretty rough in there. But it's amazing the things they do for us. But once they get into the middle of a hurricane and once they get near the hurricane, they'll take those weather instrument packages called drop signs and they'll drop them down through a tube. They come out the bottom of the aircraft and they fall all the way to the ocean floor and they measure the pressure and the wind, other weather parameters, and boy, they do a fantastic job and we can't thank them enough. This is an amazing photograph I wanted to show you. This is the eye of Hurricane Dorian last year near the Bahamas. Isn't that amazing? In the middle of a raging storm, you look up and what do you see? You see blue sky and sunshine and there's no wind. But you see that big wall of clouds. That's called the eye wall. That is the worst part of the hurricane. And I will say, I will say, you know, in all my years, I've done a lot of things, but I have yet to go on a hurricane hunter mission. My main job is to do weather here at the television station, which makes it almost impossible to do that. Maybe one day I'll get a chance to go, but one of our meteorologists did get a chance to go with a Hurricane Hunter crew during a storm back in 2004 called Hurricane Ivan. That was a bad one. Uh, our friends in places like Pensacola and Mobile will remember that one for a long time. Well, we got a chance for Brian Peters of our staff to go along. Now, Brian, for a long time, worked for the National Weather Service. He retired. He joined our team, and we put him up in that Hurricane Hunter. This is Brian's report that he filed back in 2004. Measure the storm's strength. ABC 3340 meteorologist Brian Peters made the 14-hour flight into the eye of the hurricane for a look at the brave crew tracking the monster storm. The busiest person on board a Hurricane Hunter as we approach Ivan is the drop sonde operator. Drop sondes are small tubes containing delicate instruments that send back data every half second as they fall at amazing rates, 2,500 feet per minute. Three drop sondes are launched as we go through the eye, one into the eye wall as we enter, a second as we pass the center of the eye, and a third as we enter the eye wall going out. Temperature, barometric pressure, and wind speed and direction from all three drop sondes come into the plane and are relayed back to the National Hurricane Center. The pilot and co-pilot hold the plane steady at 10,000 feet with the help of the meteorological officer. His job, to thread the plane through the middle of the eye, just like threading a needle. The flight can be routine at times. For some, there may even be time for a brief nap. But everybody is on his toes as we approach the eye. Everybody wants a window seat for one of the most powerful storms on Earth, a Category 5 hurricane. Ice crystal clouds cover the eye, so the effect is not as dramatic. But a patch of blue sky separates the top of the eye wall from the almost transparent cirrus clouds above us. The ride gets bumpy as we penetrate the eye wall. People bounce around as Ivan gives us a ferocious swat. The drop sonde operator confirms a barometric pressure of 26.87 inches, a sustained wind of 165 miles an hour, and a wind gust of 216 miles an hour. Ivan is a Category 5 storm. Our pressure readings put Ivan as the sixth most intense hurricane ever in the entire Atlantic Basin. In the eye of Hurricane Ivan, this is Brian Peters, ABC 3340. Meteorologist. You know, I'm, I'm a little jealous because Brian got to do that and I didn't, but at the same time, I'm thinking, wow, that was scary. How would you like to go on a ride with a hurricane hunter at 10,000 feet in the middle of a hurricane? 
So that's a lot about hurricanes today, guys. And again, the season begins on the 1st of June. If you're in the Atlantic Basin, most of you are, and it runs through November. But typically, you start to see those things cranking up in August and September, and that's when the big ones happen. And what's the season going to be like? Well, you're going to get some forecasts from the National Weather Service and from some those in colleges and academics, but I don't even try. It's all I can do to figure out the weather seven days in advance, but we'll just have to wait and see. But hurricane season's going to be here before you know it. All right, so next week, guess what we're going to talk about? Winter, my favorite season. If you watched our first episode, I think you know my favorite season is winter. We're going to talk about snow and winter storms. So do you know the difference between sleet and freezing rain? Why sometimes when it's 32 degrees, you walk outside and it's raining and not snowing? Ooh, there's a lot of good questions. And if you have a question, just drop a question to me. You can do that by email. My email address, it's jspann at gmail.com. Ooh, that's a good Gmail address, isn't it? People think I work at Google jspann at gmail.com and you can send your questions a little short video with your kids the parents uh, if you want to do that or i uh, the tweeter the gram all that kind of stuff that's my twitter account just my last name and on instagram it's span wx and we'll assemble some of those good snow and winter storm questions for next week before you know it that long hot nasty summer is going to be here we do anything for a cold winter day so thank you for watching thank you for learning about science the science of meteorology and remember i've said this before and i'll say it again there's a lot of things we don't know a lot and i need some of you to get into our science and help us the science of weather is called meteorology there's some marvelous colleges all across the country that offer that and if you want to be a meteorologist when you grow up Start focusing on science and math and learning about weather now like you're doing now. And by the time you get to college, I promise there's going to be a whole lot to learn. So thank you, parents, for letting your kids watch. Thank you, kids, for spending some time with us. And we'll see you here next Thursday morning on Facebook Live, 10 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Eastern. And again, the video will be up on YouTube uh, later that afternoon. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you have a great day. And we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.